Section 6 of Scenes in the Life of Harriet Tubman by Sarah H. Bradford. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. At this point, the following good and kind letter from Reverend Henry Fowler is received. Auburn, June 23, 1868. My dear friend, I wish to say to you how gratified I am that you are writing the biography of harriet tubman i feel that her life forms part of the history of the country and that it ought not to depend upon tradition to keep it in remembrance had not the pressure of professional claims prevented i should have aspired to be her historian myself but my disappointment in this regard is more than met by the satisfaction experienced in hearing that you are the chosen miriam of this african moses the name by which she was known among her emancipated followers from the land of bondage blessed be god a greater than moses has at last broken every bond as ever with warm regard your friend henry fowler the following account of the subject of this memoir is cut from the boston commonwealth of eighteen sixty three kindly sent the writer by mr sanborn Quote, it was said long ago that the true romance of america was not in the fortunes of the indian where cooper sought it nor in the new england character where judd found it nor in the social contrasts of virginia planters as thackeray imagined but in the story of the fugitive slaves the observation is as true now as it was before war with swift gigantic hand sketched the vast shadows and dashed in the highlights in which romance loves to lurk and flash forth but the stage is enlarged on which these dramas are played the whole world now sit as spectators and the desperation or the magnanimity of a poor black woman has power to shake the nation that so long was deaf to her cries we write of one of these heroines of whom our slave annals are full a woman whose career is as extraordinary as the most famous of her sex can show araminta ross now known by her married name of tubman with her sounding Christian name changed to Harriet, is the granddaughter of a slave imported from Africa and has not a drop of white blood in her veins. Her parents were Benjamin Ross and Harriet Green, both slaves, but married and faithful to each other. They still live in old age and poverty, but free on a little property at Auburn, New York which their daughter purchased for them from Mr. Seward, the Secretary of State. She was born, as near as she can remember, in 1820 or in 1821, in Dorchester County, on the eastern shore of Maryland, and not far from the town of Cambridge. She had ten brothers and sisters, of whom three are now living, all at the north, and all rescued from slavery by harriet before the war she went back just as the south was preparing to secede to bring away a fourth but before she could reach her she was dead three years before she had brought away her old father and mother at great risk to herself when harriet was six years old she was taken from her mother and carried ten miles to live with james cook whose wife was a weaver to learn the trade of weaving while still a mere child cook sent her to watching his muskrat traps which compelled her to wade through the water it happened that she was once sent when she was ill with the measles and taking cold from wading in the water in this condition she grew very sick and her mother persuaded her master to take her away from cook's until she could get well another attempt was made to teach her weaving but she would not learn for she hated her mistress and did not want to live at home as she would have done as a weaver for it was the custom then to weave the cloth for the family or a part of it 
in the house. Soon after she entered her teens, she was hired out as a field hand, and it was while thus employed that she received a wound which nearly proved fatal, from the effects of which she still suffers. In the fall of the year, the slaves there work in the evening, cleaning up wheat, husking corn, etc. On this occasion, one of the slaves of a farmer named Barrett left his work and went to the village store in the evening. The overseer followed him, and so did Harriet. When the slave was found, the overseer swore he should be whipped, and called on Harriet, among others, to help tie him. She refused, and as the man ran away, she placed herself in the door to stop pursuit. The overseer caught up a two-pound weight from the counter and threw it at the fugitive, but it fell short and struck Harriet a stunning blow on the head. It was long before she recovered from this, and it has left her subject to a sort of stupor or lethargy at times, coming upon her in the midst of conversation or whatever she may be doing, and throwing her into a deep slumber from which she will presently rouse herself and go on with her conversation or work. After this, she lived for five or six years with John Stewart, where at first she worked in the house, but afterwards hired her time. And Dr. Thompson, son of her master's guardian, stood for her, that is, was her surety for the payment of what she owed. She employed the time thus hired in the rudest labors, drove oxen, carted, plowed, and did all the work of a man, sometimes earning money enough in a year, beyond which she paid her master, to buy a pair of steers worth forty dollars. The amount exacted of a woman for her time was fifty or sixty dollars, of a man one hundred to one hundred and fifty dollars. Frequently Harriet worked for her father, who was a timber inspector, and superintended the cutting and hauling of great quantities of timber for the Baltimore shipyards. Stewart, his temporary master, was a builder, and for the work of Ross used to receive as much as five dollars a day sometimes, he being a superior workman. While engaged with her father, she would cut wood, haul logs, etc. Her usual stint was half a cord of wood in a day. Harriet was married somewhere about 1844, to a free colored man named John Tubman, but she had no children. For the last two years of slavery, she lived with Dr. Thompson before mentioned, her own master not being yet of age, and Dr. T's father being his guardian, as well as the owner of her own father. In 1849, the young man died and the slaves were to be sold, though previously set free by an old will. Harriet resolved not to be sold, and so, with no knowledge of the North, having only heard of Pennsylvania and New Jersey, she walked away one night, alone. She found a friend in a white lady who knew her story and helped her on her way. After many adventures, she reached Philadelphia, where she found work and earned a small stock of money. With this money in her purse, she traveled back to Maryland for her husband, but she found him married to another woman and no longer caring to live with her. This, however, was not until two years after her escape, for she does not seem to have reached her old home in her first two expeditions. In December 1850, she had visited Baltimore and brought away her sister and two children who had come up from Cambridge in a boat under charge of her sister's husband, a free black. A few months after, she had brought away her brother and two other men, but it was not till the fall of 1851 that she found her husband and learned of his infidelity. She did not give way to rage or grief, but collected a party of fugitives and brought them safely to Philadelphia. In December of the same year, she returned 
and led out a party of eleven among them her brother and his wife with these she journeyed to canada and there spent the winter for this was after the enforcement of mason's fugitive slave bill in philadelphia and boston and there was no safety except under the paw of the british lion as she quaintly said but the first winter was terribly severe for these poor runaways they earned their bread by chopping wood in the snows of a canadian forest they were frost-bitten hungry and naked harriet was their good angel she kept house for her brother and the poor creatures boarded with her she worked for them begged for them prayed for them with the strange familiarity of communion with god which seems natural to these people and carried them by the help of god through the hard winter in the spring she returned to the states and as usual earned money by working in the hotels and families as a cook from cape may in the fall of eighteen fifty two she went back once more to maryland and brought away nine more fugitives up to this time she had expended chiefly her own money in these expeditions money which she had earned by hard work in the drudgery of the kitchen never did any one more exactly fulfill the sense of george herbert quote, a servant with this clause makes drudgery divine but it was not possible for such virtues long to remain hidden from the keen eyes of the abolitionists she became known to thomas garrett the large-hearted quaker of wilmington who has aided the escape of three thousand fugitives she found warm friends in philadelphia and new york and wherever she went these gave her money which she never spent for her own use but laid up for the help of her people and especially for her journeys back to the land of egypt as she called her old home by reason of her frequent visits there always carrying away some of the oppressed she got among her people the name of moses which it seems she still retains between eighteen fifty two and eighteen fifty seven she made but two of these journeys in consequence partly of the increased vigilance of the slaveholders who had suffered so much by the loss of their property a great reward was offered for her capture and she several times was on the point of being taken but always escaped by her quick wit or by warnings from heaven for it is time to notice one singular trait in her character she is the most shrewd and practical person in the world yet she is a firm believer in omens dreams and warnings she declares that before her escape from slavery she used to dream of flying over fields and towns and rivers and mountains looking down upon them like a bird and reaching at last a great fence or sometimes a river over which she would try to fly but it appeared like i wouldn't have the strength and just as i was sinking down there would be ladies all dressed in white over there and they would put out their arms and pull me across there is nothing strange in this perhaps but she declares that when she came north she remembered these very places as those she had seen in her dreams and many of the ladies who befriended her were those she had been helped by in her visions then she says she always knows when there is danger near her she does not know how exactly but appears like my heart go flutter flutter and then they may say peace peace as much as they likes i know it's going to be war she is very firm on this point and ascribes to this her great impunity in spite of the lethargy before mentioned which would seem likely to throw her into the hands of her enemies she says she inherited this power 
that her father could always predict the weather and that he foretold the mexican war in 1867 she made her most venturesome journey for she brought with her to the north her old parents who were no longer able to walk such distances as she must go by night consequently she must hire a wagon for them and it required all her ingenuity to get them through maryland and delaware safe she accomplished it however and by the aid of her friends she brought them safe to canada where they spent the winter her account of their sufferings there of her mother's complaining and her own philosophy about it is a lesson of trust in providence better than many sermons but she decided to bring them to a more comfortable place and so she negotiated with mr seward then in the senate for a little patch of ground with a house on it at auburn near his own home to the credit of the secretary of state it should be said that he sold her the property on very favorable terms and gave her some time for payment to this house she removed her parents and set herself to work to pay for her purchase it was on this errand that she first visited boston we believe in the winter of eighteen fifty eight fifty nine she brought a few letters from her friends in new york but she could herself neither read nor write and she was obliged to trust to her wits that they were delivered to the right persons one of them as it happened was to the present writer who received it by another hand and called to see her at her boarding house it was curious to see the caution with which she received her visitor until she felt assured that there was no mistake one of her means of security was to carry with her the daguerreotypes of her friends and show them to each new person if they recognized the likeness then it was all right pains were taken to secure her the attention to which her great services to humanity entitled her and she left new england with a handsome sum of money towards the payment of her debt to mr seward before she left however she had several interviews with captain brown then in boston he is supposed to have communicated his plans to her and to have been aided by her in obtaining recruits and money among her people at any rate he always spoke of her with the greatest respect and declared that general tubman as he styled her was a better officer than most whom he had seen and could command an army as successfully as she had led her small parties of fugitives her own veneration for captain brown has always been profound and since his murder has taken the form of a religion she had often risked her own life for her people and she thought nothing of that but that a white man and a man so noble and strong should take upon himself the burden of a despised race she could not understand and she took refuge from her perplexity in the mysteries of her fervid religion again she laid great stress on a dream which she had just before she met captain brown in canada she thought she was in a wilderness sort of place all full of rocks and bushes when she saw a serpent raise its head among the rocks and as it did so it became the head of an old man with a long white beard gazing at her wishful like just as if he were going to speak to me and then two other heads rose up beside him younger than he and as she stood looking at them and wondering what they could want with her a great crowd of men rushed in and struck down the younger heads and then the head of the old man still looking at her so wishful this dream she had again and again and could not interpret it but when she met captain brown shortly after behold he was the very image of the head she had seen but still she could not make out what her dream signified 
till the news came to her of the tragedy of harper's ferry and then she knew the two other heads were his two sons she was in new york at that time and on the day of the affair at harper's ferry she felt her usual warning that something was wrong she could not tell what finally she told her hostess that it must be captain brown who was in trouble and that they should soon hear bad news from him the next day's newspaper brought tidings of what had happened her last visit to maryland was made after this in december eighteen sixty and in spite of the agitated condition of the country and the great watchfulness of the slaveholders she brought away seven fugitives one of them an infant which must be drugged with opium to keep it from crying on the way and so revealing the hiding place of the party she brought these safely to new york but there a new difficulty met her it was the mad winter of compromises when state after state and politician after politician went down on their knees to beg the south not to secede mr seward and many of the most patriotic and distinguished citizens of the country went over to the side of compromise they were anxious to avert the horrors of a civil war at almost any cost they have since become among its most earnest supporters those anxious months when darkness settled over our political prospects were viewed by all classes with deep forebodings and by none more so than those who like harriet had rendered themselves obnoxious to the supporters of slavery by running off so many of their race from its dominions fears for her personal safety caused harriet's friends to hurry her off to canada sorely against her will she did not long remain there the war broke out for which she had been long looking and she hastened to her new england friends to prepare for another expedition to maryland to bring away the last of her family before she could start however the news came of the capture of port royal instantly she conceived the idea of going there and working among her people on the islands and the mainland money was given her a pass was secured through the agency of governor andrew and she went to beaufort there she has made herself useful in many ways has been employed as a spy by general hunter and finally has piloted colonel montgomery on his most successful expedition we gave some notice of this fact last week since then we have received the following letter dictated by her from which it appears that she needs some contributions for her work we trust she will receive them for none has better deserved it she asks nothing for herself except that her wardrobe may be replenished and even this she will probably share with the first needy person she meets beaufort south carolina june thirtieth eighteen sixty three quote, last fall when the people here became very much alarmed for fear of an invasion from the rebels all my clothes were packed and sent with others to hilton head and lost and i have never been able to get any trace of them since i was sick at the time and unable to look after them myself i want among the rest a bloomer dress made of some coarse strong material to wear on expeditions in our late expedition up the combahee river in coming on board the boat i was carrying two pigs for a poor sick woman who had a child to carry and the order double quick was given and i started to run stepped on my dress it being rather long and fell and tore it almost off so that when i got on board the boat there was hardly anything left of it but shreds i made up my mind that i would never wear a long dress on another expedition of the kind but would have a bloomer as soon as i could get it so please make this known to the ladies if you will for i expect to have use for it very soon probably before they can get it to me 
you have without doubt seen a full account of the expedition i refer to don't you think we colored people are entitled to some credit for that exploit under the lead of the brave colonel montgomery we weakened the rebels somewhat on the combahee river by taking and bringing away seven hundred and fifty six head of their most valuable livestock known up in your region as contrabands and this too without the loss of a single life on our part though we had good reason to believe that a number of rebels bit the dust of these seven hundred and fifty six contrabands nearly or quite all the able-bodied men have joined the colored regiments here i have now been absent two years almost and have just got letters from my friends in auburn urging me to come home my father and mother are old and in feeble health and need my care and attention i hope the good people there will not allow them to suffer and i do not believe they will but i do not see how i am to leave at present the very important work to be done here among other duties which i have is that of looking after the hospital here for contrabands most of those coming from the mainland are very destitute almost naked i am trying to find places for those able to work and provide for them as best i can so as to lighten the burden on the government as much as possible while at the same time they learn to respect themselves by earning their own living remember me kindly to mrs dash and her daughters also if you will to my boston friends mrs c miss h and especially to mr and mrs george l stearns to whom i am under great obligations for their many kindnesses i shall be sure to come and see you all if i live to go north if you write direct your letter to the care of c End quote. End of section six